voice of the Nikhil came up to me after our session last time and uh, proposed this talk. And I was really excited given that we have uh, the imitation game and in theaters right now and mm -hmm. folks are talking about Enigma machines and whatnot. So um, I think I will just let him okay. have the floor. Okay, to press this, right? Yes, I hit the record button, I'm pretty sure. I'll just check. Uh, it is recording? Yeah, I see yeah. it. Oh, you see it. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to talk about Enigma. And let me go here. So, it's completely useless. <laughs> so, <laughs> hope, hopefully you can relax and have some fun uh, listening to this talk. Uh, in other words, I, there's probably no value in coding this up other than as a fun coding ex exercise. And uh, I realize there's a range of levels of expertise. I've targeted as people who are maybe new to Haskell, so we'll go with, uh, very uh, go with the code for Enigma. So, so three things I'm going to talk about today. Just a little bit about Enigma itself, which I'm sure all of you have heard about the crypto machine from which became famous during World War II. Uh, it was initially uh, a subject of code breaking by some mathematicians in Poland before World War II and then during World War II by Alan Turing and his colleagues at uh, Bletchley Park. Uh, there's a language called Cryptol, which is a DSL for cryptography. I'll say a little bit about that and we're going to go through Cryptol code for Enigma. And then there's another language called BlueSpec BSV, which is a hardware design language, both of which are heavily uh, influenced by Haskell. So after going through this, we'll go through this code. And here, in all of these, we'll, we'll run, run these codes. And in this case, we'll uh, actually generate some error log and look at some waveforms and things like that. OK. So start with Enigma. So what's Enigma? So here's a little picture of one. Uh, Enigma machine, and it's completely electromechanical. It's no electronics, even though vacuum tubes were, of course, in use by World War II time. But still, this is completely electromechanical. It was originally invented in uh, about 1918 in Germany, but then commercialized and sold in varying models from the 20s to the 40s with increasing complexity, and particularly complexity increasing, meaning these things called rotors here. There were more and more of them. <coughs> Um, as you went along. <clears throat> so in terms of cracking it, as I mentioned, it was first uh, uh, taken on in Poland by some Polish um, cryptographers. And they actually created a mechanical machine to help mechanize the searching for keys and looking at the search space, etc. And they called it the bomba, the cryptographic bomba. And uh, it uh, but as they were working on it, the machines got more complex with more rotors and things like that. Uh, so they had a hard time keeping up. And also, there was this imminent threat of I invasion in the late 1930s. So in July 1939, uh, outside Warsaw, they had a meeting with French and British cryptographers and um, shared the knowledge about, uh, about, about the Enigma machine. Uh, in September 39, I believe, was the actual invasion of Poland. So they were evacuated, and, and they were set up in another facility, which is called PC Bruno, just outside Paris. And at this point now, they were having close collaborations with Alan Turing and people at Bletchley Park uh, with mutual visits and so on. Uh, and then when France itself fell in 1940, they were moved out from there. And then it f effectively worked completely, became purely an English operation inside Bletchley Park. The, uh, the, the Polish cryptographers were evacuated in quite circuitous routes, but they were not allowed back into, into the team at Bletchley Park. <clears throat> and, and there there was this, the famous bomb machine that Alan Turing designed and created, which was a successor of that original uh, Polish bomb machine. So anyway, it was a key contributor, as, uh, as probably many of you know, to the World War II eff effort, but didn't really People didn't know about it for many years because of this very tight official secrets act in, in Britain. So how does it work? Well, as you can see, there's something called a plug board, which is basically a bunch of sockets and banana plugs and cables. And effectively, what the plug board does is, well, it, all of this is working with a 26-character alphabet. 
And what the plug board is doing is exchanging alphabets. So it's doing a certain kind of a permutation. <coughs> then there's the keyboard where you press the key that you want to encrypt or decrypt. And uh, eventually, there's this lamp board where one of the lamps lights up, which says, what's the encrypted or decrypted version of what you pressed? And over here, you see three rotors. Uh, and there's actually one, another thing inside there, which is, which is not shown in this photograph, which is the reflector. And basically, it works like this. You press a key, and the battery gets connected through that key, through the plug board, and uh, comes up to these rotors. And so every rotor has 26 contacts on either side of it. And inside the rotor is basically a permutation connection. So these 26 contacts are connected to those 26 contacts inside the rotor through some permutation. So in fact, here's a close-up picture of some of these rotors. And you also see that the rotors have contacts, and these, this next rotor has brushes. So you can communicate a signal across from one rotor <coughs> to the next. And <coughs> And then, um, so that's what you see in, sorry, in, in this picture here. The signal goes across through these permutations, through the, these rotors. At the end, you have this thing called the reflector, which is a permutation that is also an inverse. That is, if A maps to Q, then Q will map to A. And that's what allows you to use the machine both for encryption and for, for decryption. And so it comes through that reflector and then goes back through the wiring connections through the rotors, comes back through this uh, banana plug thingy and lights up, lights up a lamp. So the other, the thing that made it complex was that, uh, first of all, these rotors turn, so the combination changes for each key that you encrypt or decrypt. So every time you press a key, the first rotor clicks by one it can go around 26 clicks. And like the old style car odometers, uh, the rotor has a notch that allows the next rotor to click. So in fact, if you look at this picture, uh, sort of vaguely you can see a notch over here as a result of which it next allows the next rotor to click, uh, click by one. And so the combination is changing on each key that you press. Uh, so that's one <coughs> uh, point. The other point is also that uh, the uh, so the you could you can change the set of rotors so the the product comes with a box of rotors and you, you, you there's a pre-agreed setting that the sender and the receiver have to have about which rotors are you going to use where are you going to place these rotors in the slots which reflector are you going to use that like you could that had alternative reflectors and for each rotor what's the initial position of of the uh, of the rotor somebody had a question. Question? Oh, uh, I, I realized the answer. So, okay. Yeah, I, I do have a question. Uh, what about that switch board you talked about? In the that so it's, it's, it's also a permutation, basically, but it's a limited permutation. It's like six cables that exchange six pairs of letters. That also was part of the sort of the CPU. Yeah, that's, yeah. The, so, I mean, uh, a lot of the, <coughs> uh, in fact, a lot of the successes in code breaking were because people were sloppy in these communicating what these initial settings were. OK. Uh, I need to get some water. My sword's going to go dry. OK, so anyway, there's lots of stuff you can look and read about if you want to. Uh, in the Wikipedia, there's a couple of books. These two books are very good on, on talking about uh, both about Turing and about the Enigma, um, the cracking of the Enigma. There's movies like the one that's going on now. Many museums have Enigma machines. And I just learned about this last week, which is apparently right here, 20 miles from here, in Natick, there is something called the Museum of World War II Boston. And starting last Saturday through May, <coughs> they have a special e exhibition of uh, Enigma machines. And I'm told they have nine Enigma machines uh, on, on display there. So. Uh, Make a note of that, museumofworldwar2.org. I, I don't think you can just walk in. You have to set up a visit in advance, but uh, you should go check it out. I'm, I'm surely going to do that. I'm in Framingham, not 
half a mile from where they are. I didn't even know they existed, but uh, so I think it'll be fun to go look at that. Can you go into slideshow? Can you? Pardon me? Can you go into slideshow mode so the screen is I will, but I'm not sure it's going to be recording it because I start going into. I'm hope it's, I hope it's recording it, but anyway, there it is. Thank you. All right. Uh, and actually, I was now going to move into talking about the crypto course. Any, any questions about the machine itself? Okay. Uh, I, I yeah. So it's the, the encryption, it's not just like a substitution, one letter for another. It's the machine actually has state that it cycles through. Is that correct? Exactly. The, the state is basically the settings of the rotors. And uh, I think that's why it's called a, a oops, going in the wrong direction. And I think that's why it's called a polyalphabetic substitution. It's a substitution, but because you're changing the alphabet in some sense, changing the, the substitution function on each letter, it's called polyalphabetic. Okay. So let's talk about uh, crypto and little caveats here. I've uh, actually just started looking at crypto recently, so I don't know too much about it. Uh, but it's fairly straightforward if you know Haskell. Yes. Uh, is crypto just an, is it an embedded DSL or is it like separate? I believe it's separate. In other words, uh, so the question was, is it an embedded DSL or is it a Haskell-like language with a separate implementation? And I believe it's the latter. Uh, they have their own type system. It's, it's very Haskell-ish. But uh, but it's, uh, I don't think it runs in in Haskell. Now their compiler happens to be written in Haskell, but that's that's an orthogonal question from from whether it's embedded or not. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's talk about Cryptol. Uh, it's created by this company Galois, which many of you must have heard of, uh, in Portland, Oregon, and uh, you can get it from Cryptol.net, and they have a book, uh, quite easy read. So uh, you can download a PDF of that book. Uh, it's very Haskell-like. It's a lazy functional language, pure functional language. Uh, the DSL part of it has to do with bit sequences, bit field manipulation, Galois field, arithmetic, and so on, and uh, uh, taking uh, account sizes of sequences as opposed to just lists, for example. Um, all this usual kind of stuff. They, they also have a lot of built-in verification facilities in the language, which is part of the attraction of this, I guess, for the, the crypto community. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to switch to an Emacs buffer, and we're going to look at one file, enigma.crypto, um, and look at the code. So if you just remember the dis verbal description I gave you of the machine before, uh, it should be fairly straightforward to... Uh, to follow this. So let's go here. Can everybody read that? Uh, OK, I believe it goes. Uh, trying to remember how to increase the size of this. How's that? Is that okay? All right. So I, uh, rather than keep turning my head, I'm going to keep looking here and just use my cursor to point at things. So, uh, so this is basically the code that comes when you download Cryptol. This is one of the examples uh, that comes with it. It's described in a chapter in the book also. Um, so for example here, string is a type constructor that takes a type parameter, in this case 26, which is a type representing the size, the length of the string uh, of, of interest here. So uh, this is just defining permutation. Now, this by itself doesn't say that the string has to be a permutation. It's any string of length 26. But uh, so in this code, at least, they don't have any other separate checks that it really uh, is, a, is a permutation. OK, so uh, here's uh, a definition for a plug board. It's just a permutation. And here's examples of creating uh, a plug board. 
Similarly, the reflector is also just a permutation. Again, this is more than a permutation. It has to be a permutation that's also an inverse, so that you know, if one, C1 maps to C2, then C2 can map back to C1. There's no check in what they've done here for, for this. Beg your pardon? Aren't all permutations bijective? No. Oh, no, 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 no. They could be cyclic, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, here's the Enigma machine itself. It's a plug board. It's a sequence of N things of type rotor and a reflector. Uh, so this is a little more, in some ways, more general than the real Enigma. You can have any number of rotors. And another way it's going to be a little more general, you'll see in a second, is that uh, in the real Enigma machine, the notch where one rotor clicks the next one, originally they had one notch only, and later models had two. Here you can have up to 26, <laughs> up to 20. But it still is just works on, on a 26-letter alphabet here. So in that sense, it's not more general. Okay, so uh, here's a classical element membership function. Nothing specific to Enigma. It's just checking... Uh, uh, in, in this function whether uh, X is a member of the sequence X's. Now, I, I was surprised that it's not predefined or in a prelude library or something, but it's defined here in this code. I think it's worth spending a little bit of time uh, here. I think especially after the last talk, you should be able to parse that very easily. Uh, for, for all A, for all B. Now, I don't understand what the fine zero is doing there, finite zero, but it's finite for finite length A, and, and compatible type B, where, where on which you can do comparisons, uh, it takes a B and a sequence of A things of type B and returns bit. And in crypto, bit and bool are the same, so it's just a membership test. And uh, so I, I still don't understand what the finite zero part is meant for over here. And let's just take a look at this in a little more detail, especially if people, for people who know Haskell, I'm sure you already understand this thoroughly, but uh, I'm just going to show a slide for this. Uh, but actually, this idiom is all that you need to know to understand all the cryptol code. It's just repeated over and over again in uh, the rest of the code. So let me go back here and just show you pictorially what that uh, list comprehension notation that they use looks like. <clears throat> okay, so um, so you're basically checking if X is a member of sequences. So we're defining a sequence here called matches, which is illustrated in this line here. It has M0, M1, M2, etc. And that is an append of this sequence with that sequence. So the first element is false over here. Now this is a list comprehension where this is the expression and these are the two generators. So for each E in X's and for each M in matches. So that's illustrated over here for each E in X's and for each M in matches. And this is the fact that I used, uh, they used a vertical bar here means it's a parallel generator as opposed to a nested generator. So in Haskell typically we write list comprehension, we have a comma there which means a nest generator, which you can do here also in Cryptol, but in this case, you're doing a parallel thing like a zip, and you're evaluating this expression. So uh, if, you, if you just look at the picture very carefully, what you'll see is that the first element of this list, which is M1, is going to be this expression on M0 and E0, and you know this just <laughs> flows through. And finally, this, this bang zero is a sequence indexing operation, going from the far end of the list. So you're getting the last thing out here as your thing. So this, it's, it's really just a fold function. So why, um, um, uh, uh, you know, it uses these folds and fold maps all over the place in the code, as you'll see as we go through the rest of the code. And it's not clear to me why they don't just use fold. What is, what is the benefit of writing it in this I think slightly more involved way uh, of doing things. Okay, so coming back to our uh, code. Okay, so 
you, here you see another use of the same kind of idiom out here. This is doing the inverse substitution. So I'm given a permutation and a, a character. Uh, and you want to find what is the character that in this permutation maps to that character. So it's the inverse permutation. So the key and the character C. And so first of all, in this, again, you see this recurrence uh, where you're defining a sequence candidates and you're uh, traversing that sequence here. Uh, I'm sorry. That, that matches seems, I don't, I don't see why they, they iterate over two things. Mm. Oh, so key is the mapped character, right? Because it's the permutation. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm talking about this, this matches the previous one that you just finished explaining. I'm really uh-huh. Sorry. Yeah. I attempted to say, forget about that second line, and left arrow matches, mm -hmm. and just do that. We'll no, you, it's 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 starting with this with this initial value of false. That's the seed of your fold. Oh, I see. And then when you go, when you iterate over matches, you start looking from that element onward. So I'm, this the first element of this sequence is the zeroth element of matches. So it looks at the previous one, right? So same kind of thing here. You're, you're defining this thing. You're giving it a seed over here. And then here you're looking at the previous values uh, from, from the candidates. So it's, again, fairly straightforward. Here you're looking at it's all like the, the mapped uh, characters. And then you're. One of these is like the sort of zip. The fibs is based on, you know, one, one. Then you zip with right. fibs with its own tail. And right, right. With it, yeah. So here you're doing a parallel. Uh, so this, these are the mapped characters. And so you're checking C against each of these characters. And in parallel, you're enumerating A through Z. So that is the character that's being mapped to that mapped character. And uh, this is effectively picking, uh, this is, in fact, a don't care character. You're, uh, it doesn't really matter what you put in over here. You're picking the last P in, in candidates such that this uh, equation holds. So again, you're relying on the fact that it's a permutation, so you should get at least, you should, in fact, you should get exactly one, uh, one such, uh, one such uh, result out of it. So that's the inverse substitution. Uh, okay, so what's a rotor? A rotor is this type. Now, this part of the type, if you think of just the 26 and the characters, that's just like a permutation. That is, in fact, the permutation for the rotor. But if you think of the 26 and the bit, that's telling you where are the notches for this rotor that tell when the next rotor should click. OK? So now we have a help function for creating a rotor, which says, give me a permutation. And this string just says, which of those characters in that permutation correspond to notches? So it's some string that's uh, going to be tw 26 or smaller. So here are some examples of making a rotor. You give me the permutation, and this string here tells me that there's a notch here and a notch over here. OK, so uh, it's basically just a map over the permutation. So this is just a straight list comprehension where you're doing a map over the permutation. You're keeping the character itself and just checking whether the character is one of the notch characters or not. That's all. OK, so here are three example rotors uh, with uh, one of them with two notches and one of them with one notch and another one with two notches. OK, so now let's go to scramble, which is the action of a single rotor in encrypting. Uh, uh, encrypting a character. So basically, Scramble uh, takes a Boolean which says, should I rotate? Namely, did my, the rotor on my right, did he ask me to rotate or not? Takes the character coming in from the rotor on the right and me, the rotor, and it produces a Boolean which says, should the guy on my left rotate or not? Do I have a notch over here? The transformed character and if I rotate it, what's my new rotor value? So it's very straightforward, right? So the transform character is just you index the permutation uh, with the character of interest. Uh, the guy next to me on the left 
is going to rotate if, uh, if, if this Boolean is true at the zeroth position. And the new rotor is, if I am to rotate, then rotate by one, otherwise the rota rotor itself. OK, so now we do another fold, because now we have a sequence of rotors. And actually, we're doing a fold map. We have a sequence of ro rotors. We are doing a fold to get the character all the way through. But we also want the updated position of the rotors. So we're doing a, a map in some sense of that. So it's like a fold map. So what join rotors does is gives you take a sequence of rotors, n rotors, and the input character coming in. And I'm going to give you the new n rotors and the output character coming out. And you can see it's fairly straightforward. Uh, there's a starting position here, again, because of the same kind of list comprehension mechanism that uh, they use. Uh, they're, they're defining a sequence for, uh, called NCRs, where this is the seed of the recur recurrence. And actually, this init rotor doesn't matter what you put out there, because it's, it's just a bogus thing that's getting you started on this. Um, and it has true here, because the first rotor always rotates. And it has the input character. So you're starting it off effectively with a true saying, first rotor always rotates, and here's your input character. And then if you go through this, what you're basically saying is you're going through the rotors. Uh, and in parallel, you're, uh, you're, <coughs> you're, you're going through NCRs. Uh, so basically, effectively, you're seeing the previous notch character and rotor coming out of the previous rotor. And you run the scramble function we just set out here. Uh, and that will give you your new rotor and the new, uh, new character. And uh, once you have that NCRs, which is, as you can see, a sequence of bits about rotation, the character conversions, and the new rotor things. So the rotor's prime is just picking the third element out of NCRs. So it's just projecting the third element of those tuples. And as I said, the first one is a bogus thing. So you take the tail of that, get the actual rotors. And the output character is, in that sequence, you look at the last element, and you project out the character out of it, and you get the character for that. And those two things give you the output of your function. OK? All right, so some more. These actually, uh, that's actually the most complex function. The rest are fairly straightforward. Substitution forward, well, we substitute forward when we do the plug board and when we do the reflector. So it's just uh, this thing. In fact, we're doing a substitute forward inside join rotors also, but this is just, just the substitution by itself. There's no state change involved. Substitution backward does the inverse permutation of that. The back signal is taking, after the signal has reached the left on the reflector, it has to go back through all the rotors. So it's again, you're reversing the rotors and just using the substitute backwards thing to propagate the, all the way through. So given the n rotors and the character, you're substituting the characters back to describe what's the character coming out on the far end. Uh, and then uh, here's the full uh, enigma loop. Right? You're basically uh, given a plug board, n rotors, and a reflector, and an input character. And you have to tell me what are the new rotor positions and the output character. So C0 is the initial input character. And we take it through the plug board, substituting forward. We take, and that gives you C1. We take it through the rotors to give you the new rotors and C2. We reflect C2 to give you C3. We propagate C3 back through the rotors uh, to give you C4. And then you take it back through the plug board uh, to get you back to C5. And that's your final output. So rotors prime and C5 are your final outputs of, of, the, uh, of the machine. So here's a uh, help function to construct an Enigma machine with a particular initial configuration. In other words, you give me the plug board, the rotors, the reflector, and this uh, thing is, you give me one character per rotor telling me which character must be in the zeroth position for that rotor. That is, what is its starting position? 
So the record is straightforward, plug board and reflector straightforward. For rotors, it's basically taking the rotors that you gave me and rotating it by something, by what, whatever the starting position is supposed to be uh, for that. So here's a particular instance of an Enigma machine with the example plug board and the rotor one, rotor two, rotor three we saw a little earlier, uh, and the particular reflector and a particular initial position of the three rotors, uh, G, C, and R. And then finally, uh, we have here the Enigma function, which says, uh, give, me, give me an Enigma machine and a string to encrypt, and I give you the ciphertext, the encrypted string that comes out. So the plain text comes in, and the ciphertext comes out, and it's uh, 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 fairly straightforward again. You're basically running the Enigma loop uh, through the <coughs> through the uh, uh, the uh, the previous state of the rotors. So the initial state of the rotors is, is you started off with this, and then as you go through each of the characters, uh, you're going to get a new set of rotors, which is what uh, you're going to uh, use for. Uh, for R out here. And the decryption is basically just the same uh, as the encryption. So that's it. That's basically the program. And if we, let's try running it. Uh, let me try increasing this size again. And so basically what you'll see here are, are three files. Cryptol.cry is just the prelude for Cryptol. Enigma.cry is basically this code, except that I've, some of these comments I put in here. So it's, that's just the annotated thing. So I'm going to do a Cryptol uh, Enigma.cry. And if we look at some example runs. So if you just run uh, this example, so it's the particular instance of the Enigma machine encrypted, and Enigma was a really cool machine, is the, your plain text. Uh, what you will get is a bunch of gibberish. So if you do a set ASCII equals on, and then try it again, it comes back with this uh, ciphertext. And similarly, if you if you try running this, um, you give the ciphertext in and it comes back with your original machine. So that's that's basically the crypto code for, for this. Any questions about that? So, silly historical question. People must make typos all the time, and I feel like if you're decrypting, you make one typo and it's over. I mean, you have to... Yeah. You, you put the rotors in the wrong position, and then your error is going to propagate. If you, uh, well, it's, I mean, the... Like, if you, if you write... If, I, if I just make a typo of typing the wrong character, that's the only one that'll go wrong. I mean, the, the, it, there's no, the state, uh, right, the right, subsequent yeah. encryption doesn't depend on what the characters are. It just depends on how many there were before. Right. So, yeah. so if you accidentally type a letter twice, yeah, so then, then you could be, it could be in a funny situation. So you have to be very careful, presumably. Can you rewind one of the rotors? Sorry? Can you, re can you rewind the rotors one if you accidentally hit the twice? I don't know. I, I don't know enough about these you machines. You pull the whole thing open and reset all your <laughs> rotors and then retype the Backspace. <laughs> Backspace, I, I don't know. But the notch only has that one sort of catch, so it only goes forward. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we just did this. So uh, now let me. Uh, we are already running quite late, so let me try to run, run you very quickly through the blue spec code for this. So again, what is blue spec? It's a language from my company, based out in Framingham. And it's for designing digital hardware. And uh, if you're from universities, you can get it for free. Uh, and it's also heavily uh, Haskell influenced. Now, in hardware description languages, there are typically two phases that we talk about. 
One is the circuit description phase. So in some sense, you programmatically describe the structure of the circuit of interest. Uh, and this is particularly useful if you have regular structures. So for example, uh, if you have a repetitive structure, you write it using a recursion or a loop or something like that. Um, so it's a way of, first of all, describing a circuit. And then once you describe the circuit, then there's the dynamic semantics of the circuit itself. And that part is done using these things called uh, guarded atomic actions. Uh, we've talked about this before, so I'm not, I'm not, it, it's not too important for this talk, so we'll, we'll, uh, I'll skip, skip that. Okay, so what we're going to do is to, once again, uh, go through some, uh, the code for this. And the first part's going to be straightforward because you'll see that it's really almost a one-to-one -one literal trans transcription of the cryptol code that you just, that you just saw. Uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of hardware modeling. And I'm going to encapsulate that function into a hardware model module where I can sequentially feed in characters and sequentially get characters out. Uh, and then we're going to run it and look at some waveforms and things like that. Okay. So, um, let's go back to our let's go back to our Emacs buffer and go to enigma.bsv. Okay, so uh, what I've done in this code is that whenever you see these comments that say slash slash cr, that's the original cryptol code on that's the line number <laughs> from the original cryptol file showing the original cryptol code. So uh, I just define char b. I'm going to use the word char b for my characters. It's an uh, 8-bit value. Uh, and then there's a bunch of help functions, which I'll skip now, which is more about converting from strings and displaying them and so on and so forth. They're just some help functions. So here's the uh, cryptol code for a permutation, and we use a vector. And in BSV also, you have numeric types, just like in uh, like like that. So this is a vector of length twenty six containing char b's. Okay, so here's the plug board. It's a permutation. The rotor is a vector of size twenty six, holding two tuples, char, char b's and booleans. Okay, uh, and then uh, here's the Enigma machine itself. Uh, it's a record in, in, in Cryptol, which is a struct over here. And this vector of n rotors is shown here as a vector of n rotors. And then this deriving is just your usual type class derivations. Bits just means that there's a way to canonically convert this into bits and therefore hold it in registers and wires and things like that. And F show is like show in Haskell. OK, so uh, <coughs> this function, uh, LM, we just looked at in the cryptol code. Uh, it's, it's in the BSV library already, so we don't really need to go into it. Uh, but I think it's worth looking at uh, the uh, code just momentarily because um, it illustrates how I transform the sequence idiom in Cryptol into a vector idiom in BSV. And it's just very straightforward. And, and once you get that, the rest of it is easy. So, so that was the Cryptol code that we, we saw earlier. And so first of all, you can see the, it's, it's, it, BSV is a little more verbose perhaps a lot more verbose than Haskell or Cryptol, <laughs> and, and, and not to everybody's taste. It's not even to my taste. But uh, believe me, if you're trying to show this to people who only know C and Verilog, this is much more readable than that <laughs> and much more easy to understand. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, so this is a function, lm, takes an x of type b and an x's of type vector of a things containing b. and this is the type class constraint. You can do equality on b's, uh, and it returns a bool. So this is defining a vector whose type is a plus 1, uh, this one longer than that vector containing booleans, corresponding to that se matches sequence. And here you can see that the initial value is set to false, like that uh, initial value over there. This is just converting from the type land to value land. So A is a type, 
And when you say value of, you get an integer of that, of that value. And so now I can loop on that and, and, and basically expressing what's shown in that, this comprehension, which is the jth element is the previous matches or or with uh, this x equals the previous value of x's. Yeah? Wouldn't that take some to be around at runtime? Sorry? Wouldn't the value of a prior text to be around at runtime? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Wouldn't the value of a prior text be around at runtime? No, this is, that's because we do static elaboration of the code, and by which time we know this. So by the time you've done the type checking of this, we were only going to be making monomorphic instances of this, by which time we know it. So during static elaboration, this gets resolved. But in principle, yes, you're right. OK. So that's it. And it's also just a fold. I, we, we, I discussed it was a fold, so uh, you could... Since you're doing a fold and you're not interested in all the intermediate values in the vector, you can just, this is the code from my previous page. I just got rid of the vector completely. Instead, I just have a single Boolean value, which is computing the next Boolean value on each time around the loop and returning that last Boolean value. Or if you want, just write a fold. <laughs> this is the fold function, and just, just write fold. So, uh, OK, so you, but you saw how I took the recurrence relationship of the sequence recurrence relationship, cryptol idiom, and I did a vector where I was indexing the previous vector element. OK? So um, coming back to the uh, code here, uh, and resuming out here. So here's the inverse substitution cryptol code, and here's the uh, corresponding uh, BSV code. So one, uh, again, I just done a done a fold here without even worrying about the sequence, uh, as I just ex explained on the slide. Uh, but basically, this stuff is you can see it uh, uh, over here. So we and the as I mentioned earlier, this particular initial character of the fold doesn't matter. We can directly say don't care uh, in in the BSV code for that initial value out here. OK, uh, constructing a rotor is uh, basically a map on the permutation where you keep the character and yes or no whether there's a notch on that. Namely, is P a member of the notch locations? So it's just a map of this function on perm. And here's the function, which is uh, basically that two tuple with the character. And this is just doing the LM list membership. OK, scramble. Here's the scriptal code. Here's the corresponding uh, BSV code. Uh, modular notation, it's basically, you can see, it's, it's really just the same thing uh, as these lines are being done out here. And this thing you're returning here is over here, the notch C prime and rotor prime. <coughs> Join rotors. Uh, Here's the cryptol code for that. And here's the BSV code for it. And again, that initial rotor I said was a bogus rotor, so I've just used a don't care for that. Uh, I'm creating that sequence NCR. I'm doing a full map here, so I really care about the intermediate values. I'm making a vector of things. And it's n plus 1, where n was the uh, number of rotors that you have. And that initial uh, value is true input char and init rotor. That's basically here. And then this loop is doing the, the comprehension part of it. And we get finally the rotor's prime and the output char. So uh, I'll go through these, uh, skip some of these. It's not too, not too interesting uh, since we're also running way beyond time. Uh, Enigma loop looks. Uh, just the same. Here's the cryptol code. Here's the corresponding uh, BSV code. So let's uh, start cutting to the hardware bits. I mean, all of this is actually synthesizable to hardware, and if I'm going to use this in my hardware out here. So let's uh, skip through all these details, and um, Let's take a look at encapsulating this in hardware. So these are the same example plug boards and rotors that we saw in the Enigma code. 
sorry, uh, crypto code and the PSV code, for example. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show, go to another module, which is the hardware enigma.bsv. Uh, oh, before I go there, before I should first point out that th this function is the encryption function in Cryptol. That's the Enigma function, uh, which takes the Enigma machine and the plain text and gives you the cipher text. So that's exactly the same function here. And similarly, uh, D enigma is the same as enigma. Same thing here, D enigma is the same as enigma. So I, I can write those functions as they are. But what I'm going to do in the hardware uh, version of this is I'm going to change it uh, to make it sort of more like what you would really do in hardware, which is to feed in the characters sequentially rather than having an arbitrary length string as an argument to a function uh, and, and feed the outputs sequentially out of it. So we first define an interface for the hardware module. And I have a reset method. I'm going to reset it uh, uh, before I do an encryption or a decryption to the initial rotor positions, et cetera. And this is a sub-interface called put, which is in the library <laughs> defined as having a put method by which you can put something of this type into the machine. And similarly, this is a sub-interface from the library called get by which you can get something of this type from the machine. So here I'm uh, saying I'm going to make a synthesizable hard, by synthesizable this is just hardware speak for I can convert this into gates and put it on an FPGA for example. I'm making a synthesizable module with that interface. And let's take a look first of all at, at its local state. I'm just going to have two FIFOs by which characters coming in and, and leaving. I'm going to have a register a rather large register in this case, holding the entire Enigma machine state. Uh, I haven't bothered to break it down because, as I said, this is all completely useless anyway <laughs> from any practical points of view. And so it's a, but it's a register. It holds, it's like a memory location that holds the state of the whole machine. Uh, and, uh, and I've instantiated a register like that. And this is not needed, but just for fun so that I can show you something on waveforms. I'm going to create a vector of three registers that record whenever a rotor clicks to turn, okay, which is initially uh, set to false. Then the entire behavior is here, which is you take a character out of the input FIFO, run it through the Enigma loop, and what you get is the new rotors and the output character. So you send the character back out through the output FIFO. And here, we update the register with a new copy of the Enigma machine, where we've used our prime as the rotors instead. And here, what I'm doing is uh, I'm just uh, setting those clicks registers. Uh, this is not a very efficient way of doing things. Uh, technically, I could have gone deep into that join rotors function and returned a Boolean for each rotor that told me, did you click or not? Instead, I'm just checking whether each rotor is equal to its old, old, it's each new version of the rotor is equal to the older version of the rotor or not. So I'm already checking 26 characters against 26 characters, and I'm zipping uh, with the not equals function. So that gives me a vector of three bools for the three rotors, and I write that into the vector of three registers. And that's basically it. Uh, and so now let's, and the reset thing is the one that actually initializes the register with that initial state of that Enigma machine with a particular reflector, particular plug board, particular rotors, and particular starting positions. Okay, and sets this all to zero. And so now finally, I'm going to show you the test bench for this, which drives this. Um, and so the test bench is itself a hardware module with an empty interface, nothing outside it. This line instantiates the hardware module that I just described, the model Enigma. And an auto FSM is just a notation in BSV by which we describe a bunch of rules with particular process structure. And in this case, seek here means sequentially do things. And I'm going to first just display your, the plain text. Then in, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call the direct transliteration of the cryptol Enigma function with the uh, plain text input, 
and display it. And if it's not the expected cipher text, display that message. And similarly, do that for the uh, decryption. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, run the hardware model of the Enigma. So first of all, what you will see here is that um, there is a par n par block, which basically means do this in parallel with this. So I'm sending in inputs in parallel with sending in outputs, uh, get, re retrieving outputs. And in fact, once we start, if we were to refine the machine to make it pipelined, et cetera, uh, then it would start really making sense to do a parallel streaming in of input and parallel uh, streaming out of output. But basically, you can see here that you do the put of the jth character. And here we get a character and display, display the output out here. And then this is the same thing for, uh, for decryption. OK, so having looked at all the code, let's run it. Actually, let's first build it. So when I say make uh, compile, I'm running the BSC, which is the BlueSpec compiler, on tb.bsv. And the uh, minus sim flag is basically saying, generate something called blue sim, which is our native compiled simulator uh, for BSV. And you can see that. And the minus u is just like the corresponding flag in GHC, where you follow imports and compile them as necessary. So you can see it went and found enigma.bsv and hardwareenigma.bsv. And now it's generating the. Uh, Test bench file. And hopefully, it should finish very soon. <coughs> and um, Should have had some animation on that or something. I don't know why it's running so slow. Maybe it's because I'm doing a video recording of it at the same time. I don't know. It normally finishes by this time. My Quick poor Mac, time. my poor four-year-old Mac Air might be struggling uh, to keep up with this. Up your it, it could be because really it doesn't doesn't take this long usually. <laughs> wow. I don't know why it's really don't know why it's taking so much time. OK, there we are. We'll just clip out that segment in the video. <laughs> and I'm going to link it. Uh, and when we link it, we actually go via C as our intermediate. Uh, Why is there an EXE? Sorry? Why is there an EXE? Yeah. Anyway, we go through C. So it's actually compiled some C code and then compile the C, C using the C compiler <laughs> to, to compile that. OK, and now if I say make bsim, you see the same output. So this, this, this part was the, uh, the direct call of those, uh, the Enigma and de Enigma functions that were just transcribed from, from the cryptol. And then this is in the hardware version um, where I sent the things in uh, sequentially. So the other interesting thing that I did was when I ran uh, bsim, I, I, by giving this flag, I told it to generate for me waveforms for the hardware that ran, that it was simulating. So we can take a look at those waveforms. Um, GTK Wave is an open source waveform viewer for which hardware people use. And what you see here on, let me expand this window. OK. So what you see here is the so-called module hierarchy. So you can see basically going from the top, outside in, the, uh, I had top was the top of my test bench file. Main is our sort of pseudo wrapper by which we feed a clock into the top level uh, module, and then top instantiated hardware module Enigma inside which I had instantiated two FIFOs. So if I go to model Enigma, it tells you what are the kinds of signals you can look at. So uh, 
let's start by looking at clock and zoom it out. So there's our clock signal. And uh, now let's take a look at request put. This is where inputs were coming in. I'll append that and let's get the responses also and append that. And what I'm going to do here is, uh, let me just uh, expand that out and convert this data format to ASCII mm -hmm. and this data format to ASCII. And now you can see the clear text going in and the cipher text coming out and similarly cipher text going in and the clear text coming out. Um, and then let's take a look at three more waves, our rotor clicks. And you can see that rotor click zero always clicks. And this little notch here is because we reset back to the initial state before doing the decryption. And the rotor click one clicked in these two places. And rotor click two never clicked. And that's just because this message was not very long. So it never got to the point where it needed to click uh, the second rotor. So that's uh, uh, so, so basically, the, almost a direct transcription of the cryptol thing into BSV, we can synthesize into hardware. And in fact, uh, if we had the time and energy to do it, uh, and the time to waste, <laughs> we could get running on an FPGA as well. Um, so uh, just to sh tell you a little bit about how that happens, it, um, uh, let me get rid of this. So if I do make RTL, um, what you will see is I'm compiling again, except now I have the minus very log flag, where pre previously I had the minus sim flag. And what that does is it uh, will generate very log for me instead, uh, which is, um, it is going slow, and I'm pretty sure it must be because of the recording. <laughs> this is going very slowly. Uh, Okay, so here you can see that it created mcmodelenigma.v, and uh, if I can go into that. So this is Verilog, it's a very ugly language. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this is basically Verilog with wires, and you can see registers, and this is the FIFOs instantiated inside it, and muxes and things like that. So anyway, that generates the Verilog, and you can then you can run that Verilog through tools from Xilinx or Altera, for example, to produce something that runs on an FPGA. Uh, yes. So you mentioned that you were being like wasteful by storing the entire Enigma machine in a, in a register. When it compiles the Verilog, does it like flatten that or something, or can Verilog actually have that complex data in a register? Yeah, a very long register just has one parameter, how, how many bits it has. So, oh. it, it, so the, first of all, none of these types that you saw in my BSP code show up in the Verilog. Verilog only has one type, which is bit vector of size n. Okay. So we've compiled it into a big fat bit vector. Okay. The part that's very uh, wasteful in some sense is just that um, uh, the only parts that are changing there are those rotors. And I don't need, you know, everything else is constants, really. So that, it's only in that sense that it's, uh, that it's wasteful. Uh, the other, other thing is it's, it's, it's really, I've, I, all I've done is I've taken the cryptol enigma loop, which does the whole thing as one big function. Right. So what happens is in uh, BSV, if you write things just like that as, as pure functions, they, if you know the distinction between combinational circuits and stateful circuits. So combinational circuits are just, uh, DAGs of ands and ors. There's no concept of state. There's just a, it's a DAG of ands and ors and nots. You feed in inputs on one end and outputs come out after electrical, electronic propagation through, through the wires and the gates, etc. So when you write pure functions like that, you'll just get a big combinational circuit. So in fact, this whole thing as currently written is one monster combinational circuit that takes the whole Enigma machine state computes the whole thing and writes it back, writes the whole thing back into register. If you want to be a little more like how you might do it in hardware, you, you might actually have separate registers for each of the rotors and the Enigma loop, the, the join rotors function that took it through different rotors, you would write that as a state machine that took it to the first rotor, then the next rotor, then the next rotor, and so on and so forth. But yeah. it's a lot of work and probably not worth it. <laughs> That's it. 
Thank you.